Hey you guys, welcome again to another video and as always, I really appreciate you guys tuning in. Today we're gonna to talk about a word that um, I have been describing for years, but I never knew the actual name of, I didn't come across the actual name of this word until recently, I guess. I've heard the words mentioned, but uh, I never knew what it meant until recently. I've been talking about it for a long time, but I've came across it. The name of that word, that word is presupposition. That's what we're going to talk about today. And why is it important to you? And why is it something that you should know? In fact, many of you already know what a presupposition is. You've been repeating them for most of your life. And but yet you don't really know what that is. And I'm going to put the um, the the definition of presupposition on the screen as I'm talking here. But in short, I'll just say this. A presupposition is basically when you have a belief system or a when you state something right and you state something as fact you know and you say okay this is a fact and so f that belief system you build on that by and it's a never ending project where you're constantly grabbing for different facts selected facts that align with your primary stated belief system OK, and so that's what a presupposition is, is that you basically state it, you make a statement, you make a statement and you make it as if it's fact. Right. And then what you do is you uh, look for other things that will align with that statement. And um, and so, yeah, so the person at the end of the day can say, yes, this is factual. What I stated is factual. Why? Because I got this long list of facts that I gathered. OK, so we're going to get a little bit more into that. OK, and why this is actually, you know, can be very deceiving and, and really dangerous at the end of the day. When we get into um, presuppositions, when it comes, we're surrounded by presuppositions. You'll see this heavily in the world of religion. So religions, any religion, it doesn't matter that you point to, they will make certain statements about well, if it's the deity that they um, uh, worship, um, if it's something that that deity has told them that they should do. And if they do this, you'll get blessed and all of that. So these are statements of facts. These are presuppositions. And then what they will do is that they'll find the followers will find things that will align with that statement, you know, that these the deity or the, you know, whatever it is that you follow worship in all these different religions that are out here. Well, we're going to for this video, we're going to put a special focus on Christianity and a subset of Christianity, which is uh, the Hebrew Israelite movement. OK, and we've been talking quite extensively about the Hebrew um, Israelite movement as of as of late on this platform, simple because my wife and I um, was was part of this. We used to be part of this. And um, but it's something that we continue to even while we were in it, we can never stopped asking questions. We continued to research. And, you know, sooner or later, we started realizing that certain things just weren't adding up. You know, uh, the more we would press and ask for certain ask certain questions, you know, it just came. To, we just came to the conclusion that, you know what? This is a presupposition <laughs> situation that we're in right now. So uh, so we're no longer part of that. But there are many people who do follow us. Um, there are many people who are out there who are still part of that. And um, and those people, we still love them. You know, many of them, we still do love them, you know, um, and, you know, just as they are in pursuit of truth, we are in pursuit of truth as well. And, you know, and so we want to use this platform as a way of kind of reaching out to our, our people who are in regardless of what the movement is and begin to press for truth. And that's why we do these things here. That's why we, you know, that's what we use our platform for. For anyway, so Christianity, we're going to focus on Christianity and the subset of Christian, one subset of Christianity, which is the black Hebrew Israelite movement. OK, so when you look at Christianity, it starts off with a set of values, you know, a set of statements that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. OK, and then it goes on from there. OK, now, before I continue, I am not an atheist. In other words, I believe that there is a we do have a creator. I'm going to be very clear with that. Unlike an atheist that believes that they don't believe that there's anything greater than us and most atheists anyway, um, we do believe that we do believe that uh, we were created by 
our creator and everything that you see around us is na nature and everything. Nature is simply a reflection of his character. That's what we believe. So before we continue, I just want to make that very clear. OK, so Christianity has a whole set of statements of different things, you know, that is that is stated as fact. You know, everything from the story of um, Adam and Eve and uh, story of Lot, the story of um, Cain and Abel, the story, whatever it is. These are all statements that are made as or, or stories that are told as statements of fact. And when you press for the actual evidence that these things actually happen, where's the proof? That's where it begins to start coming up short. And like I said, again, we're going to get into this a little bit. OK, so what you'll see is there are people out there that will say, oh, yeah, there is evidence that there was Moses or there is evidence that there was this, that or whatever. But again, what you'll find as you begin to start digging deeper is that what these individuals oftentimes are doing is that they're pulling from selected works. They're pulling from selected um, pieces of history in order to fit their narrative. They're not taking a holistic view when it comes to history, you know? And so that's what we try to do on, on this platform as well. So Christianity, you know, for example, you know, will even re reinforce these things such as in some of these songs. God said it. I believe it. Yes. That's selling. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. So, yeah, so, you know, so God said it, I believe it, and that settles it. So, that doesn't leave a whole lot of space for questions, does it? You know, and a good father will welcome questions, right? And there's nothing wrong for us to question. You know, um, and then the other song is for why do you how do you know that Jesus loves you? Well, it's because the Bible told me so plain and simple. That's it. And so and so everything around that, like some people may be looking at this and well, I know Jesus loves me. Yeah. And the Bible tells me so. But I see it in everything. Everything that's good that happens in my life is a reflection of his love. Well, there are people who may not know or embrace Jesus, but they have good things that happen to them. Does it mean that Jesus loves them? You got people who are Muslims, you know, who have good things that happen to them. Does it mean that Jesus loves them or does it mean that Allah loves them? You, you understand what I'm saying? So you'll find that people will reach for things that are convenient, convenient facts that fit their narrative. So this all plays into what we're talking about the uh, when we're talking about uh, presupposition. OK, uh, Christianity, uh, Christian apologists. Now, Christian apologists, this is their job. This is what they do. Christian apologists start off with certain things as, you know, that they state as fact that there was a man of, you know, called Jesus that came down, born of a virgin, you know, the whole nine, you know, was born in a manger. Uh, all of that stuff, you know, Christianity began, you know, the, the, the whole storyline, the narrative, and they state this as statements of fact. And then from that point on, what they do is that they reach for certain clips in throughout history, little things here, little mentions here and say, see, see, th it's proof that this is that this did happen. You know, um, you know, like Noah's Ark, for example, that's a big one. Right. Uh, Noah's Ark. Yes, there's proof that there is a such thing as Noah's Ark. You know, that did exist. You know, there was a flood. You know, there was a worldwide flood. OK, but you do know that there were many, many flood stories that took place that were written prior to the Noah flood that's written in the Bible. You know, uh, I mean, uh, I mean, details down to the T, even down to letting out the, the the sparrow and the dove and all that stuff. I mean, just read the Epic of Gilgamesh. You'll find these stories that been there. And that's just one. There's other ones out there as well. And this is all historically fact. Right. You can look these things up on your own. And what people will say is, well, you know, um, perhaps it was the, one of the fallen ones, the Nephilim that pre that can't they they knew what god the most high was about to do and so what they did was they hurried down the earth 
and they went out and played these things out so that they can bring bring confusion to mankind that kind of thing because but like i said again they're so committed to their presupposition they're going to grasp on or even make up things to make sure that it lines up to their stated belief right well same thing with the and then when you start bridging this over to let's say the hebrew doctrine for example you got hebrews who will swear up and down that they are the direct descendants of um, Sephardic Jews. And, um, you know, simply based on a small data set. And that data set can be anything from, you know, they were black, some of them were black, some of them were, were in Africa, that kind of thing. And then, then that's it, you know. So therefore, that's the proof that we need that we are the direct descendant of Sephardic Jews, which means that we are the chosen people. It's a, again, they pull from a very small um, uh, data set while ignoring all the other facts that are out there. Let me let me show you this example here on the screen. So. So, for example, what you're looking at right now, I can swear up and down that what you're looking at, it's a polar bear. I mean, it's white, as you can see, it's fluffy, right? It's a polar bear. Nobody can tell me any different. And plus, it even makes that growling sound at times. So you can't tell me that's not a, a, um, a polar bear. It's a polar bear. Based off of the data set that you see on the screen here, right? Well, let's flip it. It's not a polar bear. It's actually a 69 Chevy. <laughs> that's what it is. But again, it's based off of a small data set of a couple of convenient areas that I cut out to make my point that this is a polar bear, right? But it's based off of a small data set. Well, likewise, the same thing when it comes to like we're still talking about the Hebrew thing, for example, they when you listen to many of these people, they select thing, facts that are convenient you know for example again going back to what i was saying earlier you will historically you will find sephardics that have dark skin in some cases they were dark as me you know um so you have he um sephardics that did that there you will also find things within their culture that is somewhat similar to that of African culture, indigenous African culture, you'll find some things, some practices that they did. You know, there's one person out here that's saying that I think there's some um, a historical account that says that they like to eat fish or they like to eat chicken. So based on the fact that they like to eat chicken and they like to eat fish, then that means that's further proof that they're black people. I'm not making this up. You have people out here who are actually teaching this stuff. And then, you know, when it talks about in, um, I, I want to say in Exodus, somewhere in the Old Testament, where it talks about, you know, where the uh, children of Israel, they were like longing for the leeks. They were longing for watermelon, you know, or they're wat longing for melons. That's what the Bible says. It's longing for melons. And you have this one person who's out here saying that, see, they like watermelon. Plus, they like chicken. You can't tell me that that's not our people. I'm not making this up, family. You have people out here who are actually teaching this kind of stuff. But again, it's based off of a convenient set of a small data set that's convenient enough to try that will kind of uh, validate this presupposition. Do you understand what I'm saying? But that's not what should be the case here. Just like in our example that I just showed you, you have to be willing enough to look at the whole picture you know look at all the facts okay so now what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at this very short video from this um uh researcher from yale university um i'll have the link in the in the um, in the description below if you want to watch the entire video but this video is um the individual is talking about the origin of yahweh now we did a video a while back um we did we did several videos on this topic you know, when you mention Yahweh, it's not just Yahweh. You also have any derivative of that as well. So you have Yah, Yahuwah, Yahweh Shai, whatever. Y-A-H, it comes from, um, it originates from Yahweh. Okay, so if you want to watch the videos, I'll have those links below as well if you want to watch that. So, um, and so we just gave like a quick, 
w w the short one, we gave a very quick rundown. There's a longer one we did where we went down and it was very um, more extensive. Um, here's a professor that's really breaking it down, you know, um, from an archeological standpoint and giving even further proof that, you know, where the origin of Yahweh and she's going to talk about that. And again, this is another one of those. The reason why I'm showing this is because this is another one of those inconvenient um, historical, historically proven facts that are out here that many people will take offense to because why it does not align with their presupposition. But what I'm saying is, is that, you know, you got to come out of that and you got to begin to look at history. If you're really pursuing the truth, you have to be willing enough to look at everything. And then at the end of the day, you make the decision on what you want to believe, but that regardless of what you choose to believe or don't choose to believe, that still doesn't change the facts that are established. So take a look at this video. Thank you so much for uh, clicking in. And like I said, I'll have some links below and we'll talk about this more because there are more examples I can give about when it comes to presupposition and um, why is something that we have to move away from and be um, and really be the people that we claim to be. And that is people in search of the truth. And um, and the truth is out there. You just have to be willing enough to go pursue it. So thanks again. Take care. P and E preserve a memory of a time when Israel worshipped the Canaanite god El. P and E wish to claim that the God who covenanted with the patriarchs is the God of the Exodus, but now with a new name. God is six times called El Shaddai. Other names are El Elyon, El Olam, El Roi, El Bethel. You can see the translations of these. The everlasting God, God most high, a God of seeing, the God of the house of God, and so on. El is the name of the chief God in the Canaanite pantheon. It's an important set of texts that were discovered at a place called Ras Shamra. Ras Shamra was ancient Ugarit. In 1928, a peasant in Syria discovered a tomb at Ras Shamra, which was subsequently excavated by the French, and it was found to contain a library of tablets that were written in a language very, very close to biblical Hebrew. It's clear that Hebrew is simply a Canaanite dialect. In fact, I remember reading one scholar said, if you go back far enough, um, you're really hard pressed to tell the difference between Canaanite and uh, Hebrew. And in these texts, we read of the exploits of the gods of Canaanite religion. These gods include the sky god El, as listed here, uh, the father of the various gods and humans. El has a wife, Asherah, she's listed third on your paper, a mother goddess. Their daughter, Anat, who is a goddess of love and war. She's quite fierce. And then their son, Baal, who is a storm god. He's depicted in mythological literature as defeating both the chaotic sea god, um, the sea god, Yam, and the god of death, Mot. 